technical research, and two, to give families a voice in the design and conduct of future research studies. So when we start having drug companies that are interested in developing drugs for family McDermott syndrome, we want them to be focused on the things that really matter to our children. And so this is your opportunity to talk about what, what's tr most troubling. You know, within epilepsy, is it controlling the numbers of seizures or controlling the intensity of seizures? Those are the kinds of things that we want to hear from you and know about, and that information will be used to inform future research studies and eventually clinical trials. So, we want your voices to be heard. So in 2016, Dr. Lauren Schmidt from the University of Texas at Southwestern wrote a series of white papers which we posted to our website. This year, Dr. Kimberly Goodspeed, where is she? Could you please stand up? She's all the way in the back of the room. She's a neurologist at UT Southwestern. She will write a paper um, that is going to be submitted to a journal for publication, kind of with the findings. It'll capture some of the findings that you're going to hear from research, some of the data from poll everywhere, and your, your, your anecdotes that you're sharing and that your note takers are capturing. So findings presented by the speakers. There we go. OK outcomes. So what, what has this done? Why, why do we do the McPosium? What does it really mean? How does it change and transform science? So an example of this, from the 2016 McPosium, we heard some concerns from the parents of older individuals about what's happening as their children age. And as a consequence, our foundation has funded an adult natural history study, which will include 30 individuals um, who are adults, and they will be added to the natural history study being done by the Developmental Synaptopathy Consortium. Um, the other thing we heard was GI problems are, are significant for a lot of people, and so we are funding a small microbiome study, and many of you may have heard about the poop study that's going on right now, and there are opportunities to participate in that while you are here. So here's the format of the McPosium. We're going to talk about six different topics, and each topic will include three segments. The first segment is a 20-minute expert talk given by a subject matter expert, a researcher, or a clinician working in the field. They'll provide some background about that topic. Then we'll have 20 minutes of roundtable discussion at which you guys will talk and share your experiences with that topic. Your note taker will capture all of that. After that 20 minutes, we'll have a 20-minute panel discussion at which we'll bring some of the the experts up to the front, and they're going to offer some of their reflections. What did they hear at your tables, and how does research begin to address some of the concerns that we're talking about? How might future research studies answer those questions, and how might clinical trials um, begin to address these problems? So we'll talk about clinical trials, epilepsy, challenging behavior, genetics, GI, and regression. So, you know, unfortunately, we only have a limited amount of time for the Phelan McPosium. There's so much happening in research right now, so we just want to tell you a few of the highlights. Um, so tomorrow morning, there will be a poster session going on, and if you want to meet some researchers and talk with them about their research, you can come at 8 a.m. Researchers, we want you here at 7.30 to post your posters and start reviewing each other's posters. But families, you're invited to come at 8 o'clock and have a cup of coffee. Um, tomorrow afternoon at 1.30, there will be a scientific symposium, and this is really oriented to scientists, but we'll have some extra chairs available in the room or any families that want to listen in. Um, the registry help desk is right down the hall that way in the Heritage Alcove, and if you haven't yet participated in the registry, it's a great opportunity to go down there, get signed up, ask questions, upload your genetic report if you brought that. We have the microbiome study going on. It's right next to the registry help desk. You can uh, consent to participate and then pick up a little kit to collect poop, um, or there's, I think, a possibility of shipping your poop <laughs> back later. But you can go and meet that research team, find out more about that. Um, there's also another research study right now that is um, enrolling patients. It's kind of right across the hall out there. And that is a study which does imaging of your child. It's sort of a 360 degree imaging um, to see if we can identify sort of dysmorphic features that are common in Valen McDermott syndrome. Then. Um, uh, Saturday, we'll have two sessions on genetics. One is an advanced genetics session that will go into much deeper information than you're going to hear in the McPosium. That's at 9.15 on Saturday. And then another session on genotype-phenotype correlations and special genetic findings. So we have a lot going on. 
So today we're going to use Poll Everywhere for a bunch of things. We're going to put up a few polls to, to, to hear, learn more about your experiences. We're also going to use Poll Everywhere to, um, for you guys to submit your questions to researchers. Last time we did it kind of through a complicated system of texting. This time we're going to use Poll Everywhere, and you'll have the opportunity to upvote questions that you think are really good or downvote really silly questions. So we're going to be using it for that. And I think we are ready to go. So first I'd like to, we're, we are, I'm sorry, we, uh, Dr. Kulavzan is stuck in New York. And so we're going to go a little off agenda here. <laughs> um, so we're going to substitute right now the epilepsy session um, for what was originally going to be clinical trials right now. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Holder from Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. He is a neurologist and he's also a scientist who studies um, Shank 3. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Uh, so as Geraldine said, I'm Jimmy Holder. I'm a uh, child neurologist at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. I wanna thank her uh, very much for inviting me to speak today, as well as all the organizers of the McPosium, and certainly for all of you for, for coming and, uh, and listening today. So I'm gonna talk about epilepsy and EEG abnormalities and phalan McDermott syndrome. This is the third year I've given this talk. Um, so the first few minutes are gonna be similar to what I've said before, but it's background information I think is really important for those of you that are new to the conference and perhaps new to Phelan McDermott syndrome. And then I'll talk a bit about some, some new stuff uh, that we and others have published. So uh, to begin with, we have a few objectives that I would like to go over uh, during my talk today. Uh, the first is really giving you some definitions, definition of seizures, definition of epilepsy. We'll also talk about different um, diagnostic workups that, that are often done uh, in relation to seizures. Uh, I'll describe some of the life-threatening complications associated with epilepsy, and this is really a uh, discussion of why you need to treat uh, your child who might have seizures. And then uh, after that, I'll uh, briefly talk about some of the literature um, that has been published previously about epilepsy. Uh, and then I'll move to our experience at Texas Children's Hospital. And I presented some of this last time, but I do have some, some new, uh, a bit of new data to, to tell you about. And then I'll talk about uh, the natural history study just a bit. Obviously, I'm not, uh, I, I was not involved with this data, but I think it's really important data to, to talk about, uh, specifically in relation to epilepsy. So some definitions, um, seizure is uh, basically a transient disruption of brain function due to abnormal and excessive electrical discharges. And this is uh, sometimes the way I describe it, it's sort of an electrical storm in the brain, uh, such that the normal electrical activity, electrical patterns in the brain are disrupted. Epilepsy is simply, uh, uh, the definition is simply more than one unprovoked seizure, with unprovoked meaning that there wasn't something like a head trauma or a severe uh, central nervous system infection uh, that led to the seizure. 
so this is often a, a point of uh, confusion for people in that they will tell me, oh, I knew my child had seizures, but I didn't know they had epilepsy. Um, and they you know, think maybe there's, there's some sort of magic way in which epilepsy is uh, defined, but it's really just, it's simply more than one unprovoked seizure, so two or more uh, unprovoked seizures. Um, EEG, or electroencephalography, is a technique that we use to measure brain brainwave activity. And in relation to epilepsy, we're primarily either looking for electrical activity associated with seizures, or sometimes we see electrical activity in between seizures, which is sometimes referred to as interictal activity, um, that, that gives us a clue as to what type of seizures might be present, or uh, the fact that a brain is sort of irritated and predisposed to seizures. And then MRI, or magnet magnetic resonance imaging, is a technique that we use um, to investigate primarily the structure of the brain to see if there are any structural changes that might uh, tell us why an individual might have seizures. So when a child um, is found to have really just a single unprovoked seizure or, a or defined to have epilepsy, there's a series of investigations that we usually undertake. And this includes outpatient EEG, which is typically something like a 30 minute or one hour um, test looking for either seizures or looking for changes in brain activity that suggest uh, a predisposition to epilepsy. We also usually perform an outpatient MRI and for most of the kids with Phelan McDermott syndrome, nearly universally, I would say, this would involve a sedated uh, MRI, uh, where the child is put to sleep for about an hour, and we get information about the structure of the brain. Typically here, we're looking for changes that might tell us why a child um, has epilepsy, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then when a child is diagnosed with epilepsy, we typically proceed to medications to try to prevent seizures. So these would be daily medications, um, again, that are, are there to basically raise the threshold for uh, seizures and prevent uh, seizures. So there are many different types of seizures that one can have, and I'll show some videos of different types uh, in a minute, but I just want to go through some of the uh, definitions of different types of seizures that you might have heard. So there are absent seizures, sometimes these are called petit mal seizures. They are typically very brief seizures, only lasting a few seconds, usually no more than 30 seconds and often maybe 10 or 15 seconds in length. They're, u they're staring spells and sometimes associated with stereotypies, which are these uh, sort of repetitive movements uh, that I'll, I'll show you an example of in a minute. Complex partial seizures can look a lot like um, absent seizures in that they can be just staring spells, but typically they last longer, uh, can last minutes, uh, sometimes several minutes and uh, are often associated with other neurologic uh, findings, such as eye deviation or head deviation. And these can evolve into what's uh, more of a generalized seizure, what you might call a grand mal seizure. There are atonic seizures or drop attacks, which are sudden loss of tone, and I'll show you an example of these in a minute. Um, these can actually be very devastating seizures because uh, the individual, if they're standing, if they're in an awkward position, they can fall suddenly, strike uh, a part of their body, especially their head, causing uh, severe uh, injury and even broken bones in some cases. Generalized tonic-clonic seizures are what you're probably more familiar with as sort of uh, uh, grand mal seizures, uh, increased tone associated with rhythmic clonic movements. The myoclonic seizures are just uh, milder uh, clonic jerks, mild sudden jerks, uh, and these are usually not rhythmic, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So this is an example of an absent seizure. You'll see this little girl um, breathing deeply and rapidly. That's not part of the seizure. It's actually something we do sometimes, we ask children to do, to induce a seizure, in particular an absent seizure. So this is going to go, and you'll see her breathing deeply for just a few seconds. And when she stops, this is actually when the seizure starts. So um, what you can't hear is that there are caregivers uh, trying to ask her her name and things like that, and she's not responding. You can see that she's picking at her clothes, actually relatively complex movements, but these are, are actually uh, part of the seizures. That's the stereotypies that associated with seizures. And you can't see her eyes too well, but she's really kind of just staring straight down. Her lips are kind of smacking. And then she comes out of the seizure. She acknowledges her, her mom and uh, the seizure has stopped. So complex partial seizures, as I mentioned before, can take the form of staring spells, uh, but they can take other forms as well, and this is an example of one with some complex movements. So this child is uh, just laying in bed for a minute, and then you'll see she'll suddenly change her position right there, 
Um, she kind of has her arms deviated over to the left side, and then you'll notice her legs are moving back and forth. It's sort of what we call a bicycling uh, movement. Her eyes are also deviated to the left, to her left. Um, so this is uh, an example of a complex partial seizure. Um, does not, again, these two do not look like maybe what you've seen on TV is sort of grand mal seizures, but they can take uh, different forms. And then the, the last video I'm going to show you is an example of myoclonic seizures. These can be relatively subtle and sometimes uh, difficult to appreciate. Um, but what you'll see is that there is, uh, there are some jerking movements. They're relatively brief. Um, not what you would you know, call a grand mal seizure, but, but brief jerking movements. And these have to be distinguished from other jerking movements. So a lot of you may have seen these. You may have done these yourself, some, some jerking movements when you're sleeping. And those are myoclonic movements of sleep that are not uh, epileptic in nature. They're not seizures. So this can sometimes be difficult to differentiate. So I'll talk about uh, some of the life-threatening complications associated with epilepsy. And I think these are really important uh, because they, they're some of the reasons that we recommend medications, even in, in children that have had a relatively small number of seizures. So the first is status epilepticus. And this is a, a state of continuing recurrent seizures in which cognitive recovery is not complete. So that could either be uh, a continuous seizure where uh, an individual has motor movements associated with the seizure or, or relatively brief seizures uh, where the motor movements stop, but the child does not come back to kind of their baseline neurologic status, their baseline cognitive uh, uh, status, and then go back into another seizure. Uh, by definition, uh, status epilepticus is defined as uh, a seizure lasting greater than 30 minutes, although in practice, we really uh, usually treat a, a child or an individual who's had a seizure longer than five minutes as, as having status epilepticus. And, and so, you know, one of the, the things that we worry about is that individuals that have really prolonged seizures, and, in, and this graph is showing individuals that have had seizures longer than an hour or shorter than an hour, uh, there is a risk of uh, mortality associated with these really long seizures. So shown in red here is the survival out to 30 days following an episode of status epilepticus uh, that lasted greater than an hour and those that lasted less. So you can see a clear difference uh, in, in those numbers. Now, I, I want to just emphasize that this data comes from adults, um, not children. And uh, the reason often that adults have status it can be different, things like tumors, brain tumors, et cetera. Um, so there, there are, you know, clearly some caveats associated with this data, but again, it, it's just to reemphasize that it is important um, to, uh, if your child has epilepsy, to think about management. And then just shown here is the, the risk of mortality or death associated with status epilepticus based on age. And you can clearly see that the older individuals, greater than 80, have, have the highest risk uh, of death. And, and again, that's because of the cause of status. These individuals often have uh, have other underlying diseases that, that resulted in status epilepticus, such as brain tumors, et cetera. But again, even in children less than, uh, less than one years of age or, or out to 18 years of age, the, the risk is not negligible. So the other thing that we worry about is something called SUDEP, or sudden and unexpected death in epilepsy. We really don't know a lot about SUDEP, um, honestly. We don't exactly know who is most at risk, and we don't know exactly what the cause is. Uh, what we do know is that it can occur minutes or even hours following a witness seizure, and it seems to be a bit more common in adolescents or young adults than in younger children. Uh, it does, from the data that we have, um, it, is, it does seem to be more common in individuals with generalized seizures rather than uh, partial onset seizures. And the etiology, again, is not really well understood. Um, some people have considered autonomic dysfunction, apneas, or cardiac arrhythmias as being uh, potentially underlying uh, SUDEP. And I do want to mention this is something I counsel all of my uh, caregivers about, uh, but it is a relatively rare uh, symptom, uh, sorry, a rare manifestation of epilepsy. And then this just shows again that, that it appears that SUDEP is uh, a bit more common in adolescents and young adults than it is in younger children. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about um, what has been published previously uh, regarding epilepsy and Phelan McDermott syndrome. Uh, there have basically been 12 uh, retrospective studies where um, a, a, a number of individuals have been reported with Phelan McDermott syndrome and epilepsy has been mentioned. Uh, these studies did not focus primarily on epilepsy, but uh, did have some information about epilepsy. 
And you can see that the prevalence in these studies had a really uh, wide range from 14% up to 70% of the individuals that participated in these studies had a history of a seizure. Uh, there uh, is one uh, prospective study published uh, a few years ago now that suggested that the prevalence was about 40% um, in individuals with phelan McDermott syndrome. And then more recently, um, about two years ago or so, there was a detailed description of seizures, uh, seizure types, frequency, uh, and medications and EEG abnormalities in a uh, study from an Italian group. Um, that contains six patients, and I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. And again, at the end, I'm going to talk about data from the natural history study that was actually recently published, uh, looking at uh, longitudinal outcomes and EEG changes associated with uh, phelan McDermott syndrome. So this is some of the data from the uh, Italian group, uh, again, a couple of years ago, published data about six patients with phelan McDermott syndrome. Uh, they found in these uh, six patients, three had a history of seizure, uh, but there are some caveats uh, associated with this. One, uh, go back. One is that uh, one of these individuals had a deletion uh, that does not include uh, the Shank 3 gene, which is located down here. Um, and then one of the other individuals, also diagnosed with epilepsy, had a history of um, meningitis, which is a severe uh, central nervous system uh, infection that can definitely predispose to epilepsy. Um, so I just uh, say that here. Um, the, uh, the study reported that the three individuals that they had with 22Q13 deletions uh, had a relatively benign course. And I'll show you some of our data that that is not while that can be true, that's not universally true. And then uh, the, e the EEG abnormalities that they identified were primarily multifocal uh, spike and wave. And I'll go into a bit more detail about what that looks like. Uh, this study from 2014 I think is really important um, in terms of understanding when to be worried about your child having epilepsy. So from this study, um, overall about 30% of individuals at some point in their life were diagnosed with epilepsy who, has, who have uh, phelan McDermott syndrome. But you can see there is an increase in the prevalence associated with age. So very early, um, very young children, less than five years of age, uh, the prevalence of epilepsy was around 10%. Whereas if you go out to the adults, they found that about 60% of those uh, individuals had epilepsy. And there's a, a gradual rise throughout childhood in the, in the prevalence of epilepsy. So this is something you know, to be mindful of um, with your children um, as, they, as they get older that um, you know, the risk of epilepsy potentially uh, goes up or there's a uh, greater likelihood that they could have epilepsy. So what have we seen at, at Texas Children's Hospital? Well, we, we published this, uh, I guess now about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, um, where we um, looked at 24 patients that I had seen in clinic um, with Phelan McDermott syndrome, either due to deletions or point mutations in the Shank 3 gene. And we found that 46% of those individuals had a history of at least one seizure. Um, this does include individuals um, not diagnosed with epilepsy, uh, because some of those individuals only had one unprovoked seizure or some had something called a febrile seizure, which uh, uh, is, uh, is technically not defined as epilepsy. Uh, we pulled our data from data that had previously been published, uh, mostly those retrospective data, uh, retrospective studies as well as uh, the one prospective study, and found that overall there, there were about 32% of individuals who had a history of seizure from all of those studies. In our group, uh, the average age of onset was 5.2 years, but there's a, a pretty wide distribution in that uh, from 14 months to 14 years. And the seizure burden varied very widely. Again, about, four, uh, sorry, about 60% of individuals that I saw had never had a seizure. Uh, we had uh, some children that had one seizure in their life, and then we had a few patients that had many seizures per day. We saw a wide variety of different types of seizures, including those grand mal seizures or generalized tonic-clonic, uh, atonic seizures, myoclonic, as well as focal onset seizures. We did have uh, a few kids that had had uh, an episode of status epilepticus, about 20%. And then we had two children um, who had a diagnos diagnosis of lennox gastaut syndrome. This is a very severe epilepsy uh, associated with multiple types of seizures, often resistant to, uh, to medications. Uh, needing multiple medications and sometimes other um, interventions such as surgery or vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, in terms of the EEGs or the brainwave tests, about two-thirds of our patients had uh, some abnormality on their EEG. Um, by far the most common abnormality that we saw was either slowing or absence of something called the posterior dominant rhythm or the occipital dominant rhythm. 
Uh, this is uh, basically a, a background uh, electrical activity um, of the brain, is the way I like to describe it. And slowing or absence is seen fairly uh, frequently in individuals with intellectual disability. We also saw frequently focal spike and wave discharges, as well as generalized uh, spike and wave discharges. And I'll show an example of generalized spike and wave discharges in a minute. Um, we also saw that there were EEG abnormalities in children with Phelan McDermott syndrome who had never had a history of seizures. Um, so it's, not, it's unclear if they will eventually go on to have seizures or if this just represents um, the, the underlying pathology of the disorder. And uh, individuals with, uh, we did find that individuals with multiple seizure types tended to have uh, slowing of that occipital dominant rhythm. So I'm not going to show you a bunch of EEGs because I don't think that's particularly helpful, but um, I wanted to show you one uh, just to see what neurophysiologists look at. And this is an example from a child with Phelan McDermott syndrome who has uh, what's called generalized bursts of spike and slow wave activity. So this is uh, basically the normal background activity that you see here, and each line represents uh, a different location on the scalp where uh, recordings uh, came from. We then have a, a spike of activity that you see in multiple uh, areas of the brain, and then the slow wave uh, shown here. I don't know if that's showing up. Yeah. Uh, so that, this is not, this is actually not activity from a seizure, but this is some of that inner ictal activities, activity between seizures that suggests a predisposition to seizures or an irritability of the brain. Um, again, this does not define epilepsy. We already talked about what, the, what does define epilepsy, but this just gives us some idea of, of a propensity for seizures. And then uh, we looked at MRIs. Most of the kids that come through my clinic do have MRIs to look at the structure of the brain. We really did not find any abnormalities that uh, were always associated with Phelan McDermott syndrome, or really any structural abnormalities that we could point to to say this is why this child has seizures. And I just show a couple of exa examples of what we saw, uh, which include thinning of the structure here, this white band, which is called the corpus callosum. It's basically a highway between the left and right hemisphere where information is transferred. And then here, this is a bit more subtle, but uh, the, the middle region here is, uh, represents uh, white matter. Two minutes, okay. I'll go fast. <laughs> um, that represents uh, some dysmyelination, and I can talk to anyone that's interested in what that is. Uh, also, in terms of structural abnormalities, uh, one thing to be uh, aware of is that individuals with the lesions of the long arm of chromosome 22 uh, are more predisposed to a disorder called neurofibromatosis type 2, uh, in particular if they have something called a ring chromosome. Um, and I can talk to anyone that's interested a, a bit more about that, but ultimately what this can lead to are benign tumors um, within the brain or within the spinal cord as well as in, in other regions. Um, but the ones in the brain are the ones that we sometimes have to worry about because the location of those uh, can press on the, uh, on the brain stem and, and cause some abnormalities, including seizures, but as well as some, some other, abnormal, other clinical manifestations. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, we've looked also, when talking about imaging, at functional MRI. This is instead of looking at the structure of the brain, looking at the function based on metabolic activity. And I don't have time to go through this in detail, and this is very preliminary data, uh, but I, I was asked to, to kind of show this. Um, we do see uh, the beginning of some trends for areas where we see abnormalities. So I'll just point out two areas. One is the motor area uh, of the brain, the area that controls motor activity. We basically never saw any abnormality there. But in contrast, a network called the association network, which is basically long range uh, uh, connectivity between different parts of the brain. And what I'll show you is the, frontal, the front of the brain to the back of the brain. Uh, this uh, network, we tended to see more abnormalities. And that's shown here. Uh, the red represents basically uh, brain activity. And this isn't a, a child with Phelan McDermott syndrome, but this is basically normal activity, normal connectivity between the back of the brain and the front of the brain. And here you can see uh, a child with Phelan McDermott syndrome who has sparse activity of this association network. And you can see that visually with the decrease in activity in the front of the brain, in front of the brain versus back. Um, in terms of treatment, we have not found any treatment to be uh, superior. Um, our patients have had uh, multiple different uh, anticonvulsant medications, and none have been clearly superior. Um, I'll just mention that there is a trial ongoing I have nothing to do with uh, involving Phelan McDermott syndrome and uh, epilepsy, and it, this is based on Mount Sinai. I'm sure uh, Joe Buxbaum or Alex would be happy to talk to you about that. 
And then I will just mention that the, pro that the Natural History Study has published uh, data recently regarding epilepsy, and they see somewhat similar to what we see, uh, about 40% or so of kids with uh, Phelan McDermott syndrome have epilepsy. And kids with, uh, C with, uh, with Phelan McDermott syndrome can have EG abnormalities, um, whether or not they have a history of seizures. And I'll skip through that. Uh, I'll mention that the Joe Buxbaum and Alex Collison uh, published a paper recently about shank three point mutations that we were involved with. And just focusing on seizures, you can see that kids with uh, point mutations or individuals with point mutations are also likely to have seizures uh, as individuals with uh, deletions. Slightly less, but small numbers. And so I'm going to end with the practice parameters, and I'll just focus on neurology here. Kids with Phelan McDermott syndrome can have seizures and structural brain abnormalities, as well, there, as, well as other um, uh, uh, neurologic manifestations. Uh, the practice parameters suggest an overnight EEG. I will say in our pra my practice, I don't do that for every child, um, and I think the data from the recent natural history study um, somewhat backs me up that they did not identify any uh, uh, seizures in children in, in their group of, of patients. And I am being kicked off by um, Geraldine. Uh, so thank you, and I'll just mention one more thing. Um, we have a quality of life survey, um, and there's the, um, uh, the website for that. It'll take you about five minutes. We'd appreciate it if you did participate. Thank you. And y'all can pick up. Out at the registry help desk, there are some flyers about this study. I think you can pick them up. We just put them out a little while ago, so um, y'all are welcome to pick those up, learn more about that study. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna put up a poll here. It'll be viewable here, I think, in just a minute, as soon as Julie gets up here. And then we're gonna start our roundtable discussions. So we're gonna have maybe 15 minutes for our roundtable discussion. Um, but since this is the first one, I'm gonna kinda give you guys some examples of things that you might wanna talk about. Do seizures affect your child? How has it affected your child? What should you be looking for? What treatments have worked best? Feel free to talk about any and all issues that relate to epilepsy and seizures. We'll stop at 310 to answer the panel, to, to, per, to have the panel discussion. been corrected. We're not stopping at 310. We're stopping at 210. <laughs> and looks like we've got the poll up now. If you would use your poll everywhere app and, and answer the question. This is just to test your knowledge and we'll have the panelists talk about the correct answer.
Someone's going to plug the other computer. Oh, I wonder. Okay, so we have this result. And then Just to let you know, if you have any questions about epilepsy, you are able to type them into a poll everywhere right now. So if you have a question about epilepsy, type it in. If you have a question about epilepsy, you can type it into poll everywhere right now, and that'll help the panelists to have questions to answer potentially. Snowboarding, I ever since I've had like a, like a fire in my knee. It's weird. Yeah, I don't go snowboarding. I don't go skiing either anymore. I can't. I love it. Go. I couldn't live without it. I used to ski, but I'm pushing 40, and that's just not worth my I think I know what he's doing. He's locking a camera on the pole, and he's just okay. going to use the camera. That, that works. Let me go see. This is, this is good, though. This gives people questions. This is excellent. Three of them if I'm going to be in three days because I'm going to sound like that. Yeah. <laughs> we should see what happens. 
see if they have cell service. Rick, Rick, I don't think these mics are working yet. If you could get them turned on, please. And then, um, uh, epilepsy panelists, we need you up front. Uh, Dr. Holder, Dr. Harrigan, who else do we have? Okay. Uh, Dr. Horrigan, uh, Sid Srivastava, we need you up at the front, please. Testing, testing. Where is test, Dr. Test. Holder? Hello? Dr. Holder. Test, anybody home? Anybody Where home? is Dr. Horrigan? <laughs> testing, test. He's, he's coming. Dr. Holder. A little higher on this one. Okay, everybody. We're freezing the questions now. We're freezing the questions, and we're about to start the panel discussion. Okay, everybody. If we can have your attention, please. I'm using my bossy skills. <laughs> okay. We've, great. We've got... Uh, Great, I think we've got all our panelists. You feel want to slide down here? Will you guys slide down here this way so that we're kind of like a little bit closer? Okay. Yay, okay, I'm d delighted to introduce our panel. Okay, hey, if I can have everybody's attention, please. Yay! <laughs> okay, so we're gonna begin our panel discussion. We only have 20 minutes for this, and we have a lot to go through. So our first panelist, you guys met, Dr. Jimmy Holder from Texas Children's. Yay, okay. Sitting next to Dr. Holder, we have Dr. Sid Srivastava. He is from Boston Children's, and he is also a pediatric neurologist. Um, and sitting next to him is Dr. Joe Horrigan, who is the medical director at AMO Pharma, which is the company that is sponsoring the new clinical trial of ep for the epilepsy drug and Van McDermott syndrome. So I'm gonna moderate this session because seizures are kind of near and dear to me. And so first I just wanna ask the panelists um, if you could kind of quickly go down and like in a minute or less, describe some of the things that maybe you heard at your table and maybe offer up one or two reflections on how your personal research or the research that's going on in your group might address some of the concerns that families are talking about. 
I guess I'll start. Um, so there were a couple of things that I forgot to mention um, that are actually really important and came up at our table. Um, one is uh, when your child's having a staring spell, what does it mean? Is it always a seizure? And it's definitely not. And you know, the point that was raised is that, oh, you know, I have a, another child who's neurotypical who's staring all the time. Are they having seizures? No, and probably not. So an important point is that uh, a way to differentiate a staring spell that's a seizure from one that may just be a behavioral uh, arrest, you know, a daydreaming sort of event that we all can have at some times, is if you see that, you see something concerning, if you can um, stimulate your child, either say their name very loudly or to, to touch them, try to get them to uh, come out of it. If they come right out of it um, and look at you, probably not a seizure. If they're not able to, do, to come out of it, more concerning for a seizure. Um, so that's one thing that came up. Uh, the second and really important point that I did not bring up is if your child's having an event and you're unsure what's going on, try to remember to make a video with your phone. That's really important because uh, sometimes when, you know, three months later you come in to see a neurologist, you're trying to recall, okay, what exactly did it look like? How long did it last? Can't remember very well. Hard to describe. It's hard for us to know what's really going on. But if you have a video, sometimes that's really, really helpful um, in, in figuring out uh, whether it's a seizure or not. So a couple of good things that came up from my table. Can you tell us very, very briefly how your research is relevant to PM? Well, what, I know you have some new funding, right, from the NIH. So how does that connect to seizures and Phelan McDermott syndrome? Sure, sure. So um, we're, we're doing a, a few things related to Phelan McDermott syndrome. Uh, the, I guess I'll, I'll talk about some of the basic science that we're doing, uh, which is trying to identify genetic modifiers for the Shank 3 gene. Um, and so uh, kind of getting into, you know, many of you probably know a lot about Phelan McDermott syndrome, but one, one of the causes we think, or, or the main cause of Phelan McDermott syndrome is decreased expression of the Shank 3 gene. Um, so it's basically expressed at a 50% level of what should be normal. So our, our idea is to try to find uh, genetic pathways and genes uh, which, when you inhibit them, increase the amount of Shank 3. Um, and so we're doing that sort of in a high throughput way, um, which I'm not going to get into all the details. Uh, but the idea is to see if we can somehow eventually develop a drug that raises Shank 3 levels. And we think, based on the available data, um, and I kind of went through that in, in some detail, that uh, having haploinsufficiency or that reduction in Shank 3 uh, is the cause of many of the manifestations of Phelan McDermott syndrome, epilepsy being one, and uh, you know, obviously intellectual disability, learning difficulties, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I would say that's one way in which uh, kind of the basic science or translational science that we're doing is trying to address some of the symptoms related to Phelan McDermott syndrome. So my research is focused on neuroimaging in Phelan McDermott syndrome. And one of the topics that came up during, I was listening, one of the topics that came up during our roundtable was um, when family, uh, the, the neurologist was wondering about whether an MRI would be, clinic, would be clinically useful, would it change management, so to speak, if, the, the, you know, if there wasn't a known epilepsy or known seizure. And just, to, just, some two, just a quick thought about that. I think sometimes a, a baseline MRI can be helpful, can be important, um, especially if um, to establish a baseline and if there's a, there is a change in the future in terms of the, the, how the child is doing in terms of their clinical status, then repeating that MRI when there's that change um, so you have a basis for comparison. So that's just one point to kind of mention. But uh, my, my own research is looking for kind of different types of neuroimaging biomarkers for some of the repetitive and cognitive um, and other behavioral difficulties and challenges in, in Phelan McDermott. I might just use that. Um, the, what came up at our table was actually similar to what Jimmy discussed. Um, the, there were th really kind of three different levels of epilepsy being reported in, in the loved ones at, at, um, at my table. For one of the families, the um, number of seizures were, it was ubiquitous, it was occurring every day, and very treatment resistant and taking all sorts of different clinical presentations from absence episodes to what sounded like akinetic episodes, atonic episodes, generalized tonic-clonic, um, sometimes confused as well with um, uh, the stereotypies that are associated with co-occurring autism spectrum disorder. 
and um, for another family it was a, f a function of trying to determine whether or not if absence-like episodes were genuinely bona fide seizures or not. And then for the other family, they were reported to have been told that their loved one had a single seizure at one point. It sounded potentially may have been febrile related. But for me, as a researcher, um, this brought to light a very crucial issue, which is that when we do studies looking at epilepsy, whether it's co-occurring epilepsy or if epilepsy is the focus of a clinical trial, the primary focus of a clinical trial, we're very heavily dependent upon accurate recognition and classification on the part of parents and caregivers. And it was reminding me again, the discussion we had 10 minutes ago was reminding me again about how difficult that is for civilians. So for, for individuals that may not have formal medical training, and yet for clinical trials, which is what I do for a living, we, it, it's so crucially important to have high fidelity data, high fidelity reporting that's accurately date stamped, time stamped, and classified. And I was just getting a reminder about how challenging that is again, and it made me think very quickly about what sorts of resources might be available to families, even if you're not go going to uh, be involved in a clinical trial, but what sorts of resources are available to you to help improve your recognition of seizures when they're occurring, knowing that there have been some studies that show that uh, even when individuals are tethered to EEGs and they're in an inpatient setting, half of the seizures that are recognized electrophysiologically don't show up. They're non-convulsive in nature. So helping families to be able to classify seizure types and recognize when they're occurring I think is, is crucially important, um, particularly as you're getting, this community is getting deeper into wanting to do uh, clinical trials that may involve epilepsy or seizures as, a, as an end point. And um, for me as well, the other piece is a, I'm a, a great fan of statistics. I love math. I love working with data. I recognize that when I'm doing clinical trial work and looking at data that emanates from clinical trials, it's really important that that data is high fidelity. And I recognize that when you all as families are struggling with your loved ones that things are you know, some days are quite calamitous, other days are more quiet, but it's not always easy or handy to either pick up your paper seizure diary and write down the type of seizure that's occurring. Oftentimes you have to do that at the end of the day, sometimes at the end of a few days and try to recollect that. Um, I totally appreciate that because I'm a very pragmatic guy, but I have to say as a data steward, that unnerves me a little bit knowing that Oftentimes, pragmatically, we're catching data retrospectively in terms of dates and times, and just have to live with that. When we're working with small populations in clinical trials, like in felomic dermal syndrome, we typically have small numbers per dose group, and, and we will uh, as we do more clinical trials. That type of imprecision in the data can be very treacherous because it creates variability and then it waters down when we do mathematical things like looking at means and percentages. We can end up inflating our variability and then that makes therapeutic effects look weaker and more difficult to make sense of and so forth and so on. So these are just the things that are coming to my mind in terms of what we could do collectively to improve um, the quality of, for example, your clinical observations to make it easier to record seizures, types of seizures. We've been, we've been talking about things like seizure track or electronically, you know, what's the potential utility of that. So these are the things that are kind of coming out in my mind as I've been listening and, and talking to people. Great, guys. Okay, so we're going to try to get to a few questions from the families, and we've used poll everywhere to gather these questions. The first question, is there any correlation with onset of puberty? I guess this is with the onset of seizures with onset, or, or worsening poss possibly of seizures with onset of puberty. So um, I showed the data that certainly with aging, um, you know, the data that we have so far, it appears that uh, seizure prevalence goes up. Um, whether that's in part driven by puberty, I don't know for sure. Um, in general, with epilepsy, um, you know, we, can, we, we say that seizures can either uh, start because of puberty or around puberty. Sometimes they actually get better. Um, with puberty, or sometimes there's no difference. And um, even though I've seen, you know, a fair number of patients with Phelan McDermott syndrome, I cannot say I've seen a, you know, a clear case where, oh, I think puberty 
when puberty started, that's when the seizures started. So the, the problem is, you know, puberty relates to hormonal changes, but there's also uh, changes in brain maturation um, that are not really directly related to puberty. They're just related to uh, maturation uh, with aging. Um, and those can also um, drive different changes in seizures or even onset of seizures. So it's a, it's a tough question um, to answer, I, I guess is the base, basically what I, what I would say. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next question: What's the typical age of onset of epilepsy um, in adults with PMS? Uh, I don't know. I, I see three individuals that are, or I have seen three individuals clinically that are adults with seizures, um, and um, I think only, or sorry, three adults with Phelan McDermott syndrome. And I believe only one of those have epilepsy. And they had epilepsy starting at eight or nine years of age. So um, I don't have a okay. great. Is there an age when you're out of the woods to add adult family plan to adult? Do you know? I, I, I don't know. But it looks like in your graph, 40% of patients with that onset was between 18 and 64. Right, right. That's not my data. That's uh, previously published data, and that's what they showed. So it seems like there's probably not um, an age, but. Um, Great. Okay. Next question. Um, if somebody has an abnormal EEG with spikes, will this likely continue as they get older or can it correct itself? I'll let you answer. Since. Sure. Yeah. So just uh, one thing to mention is that an EEG is one snapshot in time. So it, it's, it can be a 30 minute recording or a longer recording, but it doesn't reflect a continue, you know, it doesn't necessarily predict will that EEG pattern remain the same you know, a month from now or a year from now. So the EEG pattern can evolve over time. So if the question is, uh, let's see. Um, so yeah, so can an EEG normalize? Yes, so an EEG can normalize. Um, can an EEG stay the same, but the seizures get better? That can also be the case, especially if uh, the child is on medications to, to increase seizure threshold to kind of keep the seizures at bay. So, you know, one of the things that we kind of tell, or as neurologists, we say, you know, treat the patient, not the EEG, meaning treat the seizures, not, the, not necessarily the EEG pattern. So it's the EEG is helpful, but we have to look at it in the context of how the child is doing from a clinical seizure perspective. Um, I want to pick your brain on that sure, because that's yeah. a really common question, right? My child has a really abnormal EEG, but yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're, and we're just wondering, should we treat the EEG? And I hear you saying, no, we treat the patient. Well, not in a, in a disorder like Phelan McDermott syndrome or any other genetic neurodevelopmental disorder, is there evidence to suggest that patients can, should prophylactically receive these medications to prevent the onset of seizures? Sure. So that's a great question. And in a, um, a disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex, um, which is very, well, somewhat related, but also very different from Phelan McDermott. But there's a, right now, an ongoing clinical trial to see if you can treat the EEGs, meaning if you, if you have an infant with this um, other genetic disorder and the infant's EEG is abnormal, but they haven't developed uh, seizures yet, if you treat the EEG, not uh, with the medication to prevent seizures, um, does that lead to better outcomes, better developmental outcomes? Does that help prevent epilepsy or, you know, from happening? So the, the short answer is uh, yes, there is data from other genetic disorders, other disorders where uh, um, we are trying to learn and try to better understand if you treat the EG pattern, try to get ahead of the seizure, so to speak, will that lead to better outcomes? And so maybe uh, as we learn more and more, maybe uh, some of that knowledge um, will come to the Phelan McDermott community as well. So I think that story is to be continued. Okay, great, thank you. Vigabatrin, yeah, so, yeah. So I, I would just add one thing about that, and I think that's a really important question that has not been addressed. Uh, and I'm glad you guys are addressing them for tuberous sclerosis. Um, that there is some data related to just idiopathic autism. Um, and uh, so, you know, a, a good percentage, um, and I can't think off the top of my head, I, I'll say somewhere around 50% of kids with autism have an abnormal EEG regardless of if, if they have seizures. And, and very, very small studies have looked at this to see, okay, if we treat the EEG, 
uh, do we get better neurocognitive outcomes? And the data uh, is messy. So some studies have suggested yes, some have suggested no. All those studies typically are open label, which means everyone knows everyone's getting the drug, and uh, and they tend to be very relatively small. So I actually think that's a really important question um, that we just don't know the answer to. I, I and kind of going back to the. Uh, kind of longitudinal EEG, I, I think, uh, I'm not involved with the natural history study, but I think that is something that, that can be addressed with the natural history study and hopefully is being addressed somewhat. So. Great, great. So we need to get through three questions. We have to go really, really fast. The first one is, is there a drop in pulse ox with all seizures? Do oxygen levels in the blood drop? This is easy, no. Okay, thank you. Some, but not all. Okay, next one. This one's a big one in, in the news. But it doesn't happen in every child with every seizure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I was trying to be quick. Uh, yes, it, you can have a, re, a drop in, in pulse ox for sure with seizures, but it does not happen in every child with every type of seizure. So. Right. Okay. Th this next one is kind of was big news about two weeks ago. Cannabidiol, Epidiolex. It's a medication that's derived from from marijuana. Can cannabidiol um, received approval from the FDA. So. Could it help in PMS? Sure, it could absolutely, um, and and it's. Um, I mean, what's on my mind, honestly, as we're as we're talking about anti-epileptic drugs, is the risk-benefit profile for each of these medicines. And as you were talking about tuberous sclerosis, my mind was turning around. If it was my child, what would I be okay with, and what would I not be okay with in terms of existing? as well as experiment, the, the ones that are in development, anti-epileptic drugs, and that, that wasn't the one that, that they're testing out, isn't one of the ones I would have picked straight away. Um, but no, cannabid yeah, the cannabinoid derivatives are, they look good in terms of risk benefit. So in terms of, uh, would they be worthy of, of looking at in a clinical trial context for your community? Sure, I mean that's, yeah, absolutely, I think so. That's my opinion. Now others can say something to the contrary, but uh, just to add, just one thing, just uh, um, to add about that is that some families will go on and and, and do CBD oil and, and so forth. Just the there's the caveat I tell families is, um, especially if their child is on multiple uh, anti seizure medications, making sure that uh, there's a good plan for monitoring the levels of other of the other uh, um, anti seizure medications because the CBD can affect the levels of those medications, and you want to make sure you're not missing something. Um, so just that. Okay. We have run out of time for our awesome epilepsy panel. If you please acknowledge your gratitude. And Dr. Call, Dr. Nathan Call, if you could please come on up to the front. We're ready for you. Yep. Thank you so much. Epilepsy, we're done with that. That was yours. This is done. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. We're, we're going to try to just keep on schedule here. Um, we welcome Dr. Nathan Call to the stage. He's uh, going to lead off this session with an introductory talk. Dr. Call is a clinical psychologist and the clinical director of the Marcus Autism Center at Emory University. His research interest includes the assessment and treatment of severe behavior disorders, especially in children with autism and other developmental disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Call. I haven't done anything yet. You're all clapping. I haven't said anything. You, I, <laughs> here we go. All right. Well, while they're getting started, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the organizers for um, 
having me come out. This is really exciting. I think I was talking to the table that I was seated at earlier just about how this format I think is really great. I think too often I find myself talking to colleagues and other researchers um, or parents, but I think the opportunity to both at the same place is really cool and I just think that the format here is um, exactly what is needed in a lot of areas of research and so I'm, I'm really excited to have the chance to be here today. I do have to just kind of show some disclosures. Uh, the university that I'm part of requires that I disclose these are some of the funding sources for a lot of the research that I'm doing. Um, and, and with that I just kind of want to jump into it and get going. So. Um, I will try to talk fast. I have a lot of slides and they've told us they're going to give me the hook right at the minute that we're done, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm getting through everything as fast as I can, um, but I, I will try to still give enough time to the topic. So uh, really quickly, uh, I, I work with, with folks with pretty significant challenging behavior. This is a big part of what I do. Um, the research on prevalence for these kinds of problem behaviors is, is really quite spotty, not just for, for uh, low incidence genetic syndromes like Phelan McDermott, but also just across the board. It really depends on things like how you define problem behavior and how you define severe. I oftentimes will talk to folks and say, when I interview a family, if you ask any family on a scale of 1 to 10, how severe is your kid's behavior, everybody says it's 11. Right? And so it's really hard, and, and they're right, you know, because for them, that's the worst thing that they're dealing with in their life every day. And so that's an accurate reflection of their perspective. Um, so because of that, though, that makes it sometimes very challenging to assess things like prevalence of challenging behavior, because what one family is coping with pretty well, another family is in a state of crisis. Um, so because of that, uh, these estimates are kind of all over the place. But some of the behaviors that, that we see in our clinical program and that are treated pretty commonly um, are things like aggression, self-injury, um, disruptive and destructive behavior, pica, um, if for those who aren't familiar, this is ingestion, in, in, ingestion of inedible objects, um, and so we treat that fairly regularly. Elopement, which, you know, the first time I presented uh, research on treating elopement, it was at a conference, and we had all these people come and say, I didn't realize kids with disabilities are all running away to Vegas, getting married, and I said, that's a totally different thing, right? This is, this is uh, leaving, any, any type you're of leaving supervision is classified as elopement, and it's actually the, the leading contributor to the fact that Kids with disabilities have doubled the premature death rate because they are wandering away, falling into bodies of water, having traffic accidents, things like that. So very dangerous. And then we also see a lot of toileting concerns in our clinic. Um, you know, again, I always, I always worry about this one because people say, well, everybody's got to get toilet trained at some point. But the families that I see who are dealing with this, they say this is the number one thing in our life right now is that you know, we have a kid who's 14 and not toilet trained. And, and that's a big expense. And it's a hygiene problem. And it restricts access to certain environments and community resources. So really, um, all of these are just some of the main things that we, we deal with when we work with families in Atlanta. So, and again, I think that the, the negative effects are kind of self-evident, right? Challenging behaviors like these, obviously, self-injury and aggression can, can hurt the individual, can hurt the people who care about them. Um, I think often overlooked is the fact that this, this really can cause uh, isolation and exclusion from uh, community resources. Even when a child might otherwise be perfectly able to be in another classroom, if they have a lot of aggressive behavior, they're not going to be in that other classroom, which then limits their learning ability. They aren't able to gain the experiences from being around peers that they might otherwise really be able to benefit from. Um, so it really can have a, a pretty significant negative effect there. And then just the stigma that goes with this. And I, I certainly see this, and I see a lot of the families that I work with who are just, you know, I don't want the hassle. Why would I go out into the community when I get the looks and the people point and say mean things and don't understand my perspective? So all of of these things I think have really significant effects not just on the individual but on the family as well I um, mean there's a lot of research that shows that the effects of challenging behavior are quite significant for the family beyond just even for the individual who exhibits them so really quickly you know there's lots of different uh, there's two main approaches to dealing with challenging behavior psychopharmacology using medications and then behavioral interventions which really involve manipulating the environment and learning and using learning based strategies to change behavior I'm really going to, although both of these can be very effective, my focus here today is going to be on these behavioral interventions because that's what I do and that's what I can speak most knowledgeably about. Um, if we have time and if we get through everything, I will just kind of touch on some of the research that's just getting underway with respect to some psychopharmacology research that we're involved in. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to really focus on the behavioral strategies and I hope that's okay. I hope that um, we've, if we focus there that, that we'll get through some stuff. So, 
One of the pivotal moments in kind of the research literature took place in around 1982. Um, there were a series of studies by a guy named Brian Awada who demonstrated that uh, challenging behavior like self-injury, and he was really focused on pretty severe forms of self-injury, um, were actually pretty responsive to the environment in ways that were pretty orderly and predictable. And, and at the time, that was considered somewhat novel, right? A lot of time up to that point, people thought that self-injury was just kind of random. Um, and so this was a study that showed that if we really tr sought to understand that the purpose of the self-injury serve for the individual, that that could then lead to better outcomes because we would be able to develop different interventions. And so he coined the term, or used the term function to refer to the purpose the behavior serves for that individual. Um, this can include things like what we would call social functions. And social, in this case, a lot of times people think this means social as in socialize, like attention. But the truth is social, when it comes to the consequences that might maintain a behavior, really just means that someone else is involved. Right? So if a cookie's on the top shelf and I need mom to get it for me, that makes it social, because mom's involved in the chain of events that eventually gets me the cookie. Right? And, and it's sometimes easier to contrast that with what we would call an automatic function, which is to say the behavior just automatically produces that consequence. There's no real other person involved in that chain of events. So if I, if I hit my head because it kind of makes me feel kind of good, that's an automatic consequence, as opposed to social, because I don't need anyone else to make that feeling occur. Does that make sense? All right, so, so Awada and his study did some of this early work, and what he essentially did was try to assess for an individual kid, can we figure out for one kid what the function of the behavior is, what's the purpose for that child? And this was, again, self-injury. And so set up these different sessions. Each one of these data points represents a 10-minute session and had different conditions in which they would kind of expose the kid to different uh, situations. Um, in one condition, they would present demands to do a non-preferred thing. Those are the triangles that you can see here. And kind of treat it like the behavioral equivalent of an allergy test, right? You know, the allergy test where they prick you with 60 things and they see where the response is? This is kind of what they were doing. They would expose the child to present demands for 10 minutes, and if they saw a lot of problem behavior, okay, there seems to be this relationship and contrasted that with when they restricted access to attention or restricted access to preferred items and compared that to a control where they had access to all the things that they like and there were no demands. And as you can see in these days, there's a pretty clear difference, right? The triangles are elevated and everything else is low, indicating that for that particular kid, that self-injury seemed to be responsive to escape or being able to avoid demands by engaging in problem behavior. And you can think about how that happens, right, as caregivers. What do we want when our kid engages in self-injury? We want it to stop, right? And so caregivers get pretty good at figuring out how to make it stop. And that sometimes means that you back off. or If you, you were given demands, you stop those demands and say, never mind, don't worry, just calm down. And for the kid, that means, well, that's a pretty effective way to make demand stop, right? And, and so that's essentially what he was showing is that this child is using problem behavior to make demands, to engage in non-preferred activities, stop. But, the, but it also showed that the same system or approach could be used to identify other functions like the ones I described, access to attention, or even whether the behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement. So as I said, this was done quite a while ago. There's about 40 years of research now where this has been replicated over and over and over and over again. The last time I checked, which was six months or so ago, there's 170 papers on this, 26 different journals. It's pretty well understood. It's pretty well established at this point. It's a known assessment methodology whoops, um, for how we go about identifying for a particular kid. And, and the research also shows that when behavioral interventions are based on an understanding of the purpose of the behavior, the function, that the outcomes are better, that you produce better treatments that work better because they're tailored to that kid and, and understanding why that behavior occurs. It's also been extended to a lot of different behaviors. And here's just a partial list of some of the behaviors that have been um, assessed using functional assessment, functional analysis methodology. This is just an example of, I pulled a kid that we saw a couple of months ago from our clinic just to show you an example of what this can sometimes look like. So these are data from a, a child that we saw who had engaged in pretty significant aggression. Um, and we, each one of these data points represents one 10 minute observation. And initially we were just doing a baseline condition. So someone would come in and he'd be playing with his iPad and say, hey, we got to put the iPad away. And if he was aggressive, they'd say, never mind, you can keep your iPad, right? Kind of like what a lot of parents might do. And what you can see is when we did that, we saw an average about, of about five aggressive episodes per minute, right? So pretty high rate aggressive behavior. Um, and so that's what's represented here. At the same time, you'll see we were, look, we were also measuring how often did he use some other behavior to access the iPad? And the answer was none because he really didn't have a lot of other skills in his repertoire. So we took the time to teach him another way to request the iPad. We, in his case, we just taught him to exchange a card that said iPad, right? If he handed a card that said iPad, it was his favorite thing. Parents actually had three iPads at everywhere they went because if the battery to this one dies, we need our backup. And if, if that one were to get thrown across the room, heaven forbid, we need our, our backup backup. So they would go everywhere with three iPads because that was the thing, right? So, but he couldn't request it. So we had, taught him just hand somebody a card that says iPad. And if they handed the iPad, we'd give them the iPad. 
And sure enough, when we did that, you'll see that in, in this top panel here, uh, the amount of aggressive behavior started to decrease and requests started to go up, showing this inverse relationship. Not super complicated, but again, we turned it off by basically not giving him his card. If someone forgets the card at home or don't take it with them, well, requests decrease, but pretty quickly, problem behavior comes back, and we replicated that a second time around just to show it wasn't a fluke, right? I mean, it's actually because of what we think it is. I mean, sure enough, that seemed to be working pretty well, which is great. Everyone's excited. We got a kid now who can ask for an iPad instead of beating someone up to get an iPad. But there's some limitations, right? Now he's just still getting the iPad all the time. And what happens when the battery dies and he throws the one across the room and we need that fourth iPad that we just didn't have with us that time? So these are the same data just kind of compressed. And I'll show you where we went next with that. Because again, I think within the behavior analytic literature, too often this is where we stop. We say, look, yo, we replaced this problem behavior with good behavior, pat ourselves on the back, go home, publish those data, and feel really good about ourselves. But it's really not that practical, right? This isn't necessarily something that a family can use. So one of the things that we did in, the, in this case is we actually used a set of signals to signal, okay, well, sometimes when you ask for the iPad, you can have the iPad. And sometimes when you ask for the iPad, you just can't have the iPad because we got to go to the store, we got to go to the doctor's appointment, we have to do something else. And we just used different signals in his environment. We had a, just a little um, a card. I'm sorry, we would have him wear a bracelet. And yet when, he wore, or when mom was wearing the red bracelet, um, it meant if he asked for the iPad, he couldn't have it. And when mom was wearing the green bracelet, it meant that if he asked for the iPad, he could have the iPad. And initially, it's heavily skewed towards green, right? You can see in this case, 80 seconds. So he had to tolerate 80 seconds of red bracelet for five minutes of green bracelet, right? And, it, and initially, he's doing all right. We saw a little bit of a spike. But over time, we started to gradually increase the amount of time that mom's wearing the red bracelet till we got to 900 seconds. For those of you who are like me and math's not your strong, that's about 15 minutes, right? So 15 minutes he could tolerate without, go, without actually asking for the iPad. He wouldn't engage in a lot of problem behavior. And here you can see requests below. So he's still asking when the time comes. When it's green, he's asking. When it's red, that's the uh, close, the open the triangles. He's not asking when it's red. He is asking when it's green. He's not engaging in problem behavior either way for about 15 minutes at a time. We say to ourselves, all right, we can take this show on the road now. We go out into the home. We go out into the community. Continue to extend. He's going about 45 minutes at this point when I checked in a couple weeks ago. So again, just some of this being able to build on these types of interventions, which come from this idea of understanding that for him, problem behavior was essentially a request. Problem behavior aggression meant, I would like my iPad, please. If you don't mind, might I please have the iPad? The only problem was he wasn't saying that, and he was using aggression to get it instead. So again, this is research that's pretty well established. This is a methodology that's been known for quite a, lot, quite a while. Unfortunately, not, lot, not as many people, even people who are trained in behavior analysis, your BCBAs, there's a research, recent study that showed only about 50% of BCBAs are trained to do this type of work, which is unfortunate, but we're working on that. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it's important to look at what comes next within this type of work. Um, unfortunately, some of the same things that make that have led us to this point um, are preventing us from moving beyond this point. So there's a, there's a book in business that says, you know, what got you here won't get you there. And that's essentially the, the, confront the thing that we're being confronted with within the literature on how do we, and the research on how we treat problem behavior, which is to say, up until now, most of the research on these types of interventions have been using small n single subject methods, right, where we're really trying to do what I showed there, turn the behavior on and off. We introduce something, we have three kids, and we show hundreds and hundreds of data points that demonstrate that we have a really clear effect on how the behavior is occurring, um, but it also means that we're not necessarily looking at how these types of interventions generalize to other populations. It also raises questions about pu publication bias, which is to say, you know, you look at some of these things and you see how many uh, cases are in a data set. There might be three or four, um, and, and people wonder about, well, maybe that's just the three or four that worked, and there's a hundred like that somewhere else where somebody tried and it didn't work, but you can't publish negative results, and so there's some limitations there as well. Just an example of one of the ways that our group is trying to deal with this. This was a, a study on pica. So again, pica, it's really dangerous. Kids are, if, I don't know if you can see, there's a safety pin in that kid's esophagus. Um, you know, we see, I, if you ever want to see a cool x-ray collection, I'm your guy. I have kids who swallowed really weird stuff, dangerous stuff. It's had to be taken out of them. Um, and if you look at the treatment literature on pica, uh, up until a year or two ago, the largest data set had three kids in that treatment data set, right? That, and they had these behavioral interventions to treat pica. It's, it's used, doing a functional analysis like I described. It's doing the same kind of stuff as I just described earlier, but only had three kids. In it. And there are some tricks to it. You got to be careful and you got to think about how you're going to approach that. We have what we call the pica cookbook, which is all the things that look like they're inedible but are actually safe to eat. We go to a lot of Asian grocery stores, get stuff like seaweed that looks like string and things that look like rocks that are starches that are safe to eat, but if you bait a room and they eat it, the kid's not going to choke or be hurt. And so what we said was, look, let's just go through all of our existing data, 
We see kids with Pike all the time. We went back in the last uh, five years, I want to say, and we found 13 data sets. And we're able to demonstrate that, that the same approach that's been shown in these handful of data sets uh, seemed to be working pretty well. We had a relatively large effect size, 1.8, which is a, a pretty strong effect indicating that these interventions can work pretty well, but we instantly quintupled or quadrupled the next largest data set by actually just looking at over a number of treatments uh, over a court period of time and looking at every kid who came through the door, right? We didn't cherry pick anything. Every kid who came in in the last period of time who we saw for PICA, look at their data and show that sure enough, if you take this approach, the outcomes can work. And we've done similar studies at this point to look at treatment for elopement, treatment for encopresis, which again is toileting, but for bowel movements, and also certain treatment strategies, things like token economies. Oops. Yeah, I saw somebody nodding, yes. I'm happy, yeah, sure. Is that coming out of my time? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the next, the, the piece that's missing though, again, is just demonstrating that, you know, we had 12 kids walk through the door and this is what we saw. That's great. It's a big improvement over three kids, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And one of the big sets of questions is around, well, these single subject data, these one kid, two kid, three kid at a time, they're really good for showing what's possible. When, if you're working with one kid, that's what you want to know. I want to know what's going to, what can I achieve with this kid who's in my clinic here today, right? But there's also a whole set of questions around what's probable. That, you know, if, what, which types of kids benefit from this, or if you give me 50 kids like this, how many of them are going to make those kinds of gains? And that's really where uh, clinical trials, efficacy trials are important. And so we have some clinical trials in our way right now where our program is doing the same kinds of interventions around elopement and encopresis. Also, telehealth is something that we're doing a lot right now because we were talking at our table a little bit about people aren't able to access good behavioral interventionists, and that's a real issue nationwide, really worldwide. And so we're doing telehealth, which is not necessarily the typical clinic to clinic. Like there's someone, you go to a hospital, they're at a hospital, you get on a camera, you Skype. We're actually doing clinic to home because so much of this intervention needs to happen in the home. So if the family has a smartphone, then we can look in their home and coach them through strategies. And so far, again, our, our outcomes are quite good for that. This is a, an example of one of the, uh, some of the work that we did, again, following this pathway from small end through larger trials. So we initially started doing this clinical trial because we had one kid walk through our door. We had a toileting clinic, but we focused primarily on urination because there's a lot you can do to be successful with that. I'm already down to two minutes. So we, we went ahead and we extended this to encopresis because a kid walked through our door who was getting ready to receive a colostomy bag because he couldn't be toilet trained and said, people said this kid has to be fully sedated every three weeks in order to clean him out. And so we'll give it a shot. And I think innovation often starts with one kid, and that's what took place here. We were able to do a small, we were able to be successful with him, turned into a small data set, clinical trial, and now we're in the midst of a larger clinical trial with 150 kids. Really quickly about ex, uh, outcome measures. One of the things that we're really involved into is trying to, again, extend the work that we do outward and see people who aren't able to access services otherwise. One of the real limitations, as was mentioned earlier, things like data collection. And so um, we're working with some folks at Georgia Tech who've done work on uh, Parkinson's and being able to detect tremors with wearable um, tech using accelerometers. So these are small devices that can just, they're in your smartphone. You have, probably have one on your body right now. They can detect motion. Um, so we have kids who are wearing these on their wrists and ankles who engage in self-injury or aggressive behavior. These are really quickly what some of those data look like. And in particular, we're trying to differentiate between different types of behavior. So being able to tell from an accelerometry standpoint the difference between slapping someone across the face and giving someone a high five can be kind of tricky. And so we're using machine learning to accomplish that. Um, basically what we do is the accelerometer detects, hey, there was something that happened there, but the accelerometer can't really tell whether it was the slap across the face or the high five. Um, so from that, we score video of the same session and then use machine learning procedures where as we add more and more data and give it more and more instances of that was aggression, that was a high five, the algorithm is able to differentiate between those different types of behaviors. And, and again, this is a heat map that kind of shows that we're so far showing pretty good sensitivity. This was from our first study. We have a second study now that's actually gotten quite better um, where we're able to identify these behaviors pretty, pretty accurately. Sorry? <laughs> you got to move to Atlanta. I'm sorry. What's that? Yeah. We have a book. We have about 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right, so I'll quickly end. Just I said before I would mention something about um, pharmacology. One of the things that we're in the midst of doing, I, I talked a lot about function and the purpose that the behavior serves for the kid. I talked about the difference between these automatic behaviors and these behaviors that occur to produce some social outcome through another person. And to date, most of the psychopharmacology research has really lumped all those kids together, right? Self-injury is self-injury. And we're looking for medications that treat self-injury or aggression or what have you. 
And so our, our perspective is why would we assume that a child who hits somebody to get a, who hits himself to get a cookie or hits himself to, because it feels good, those are two very different functions. And we would think that perhaps medications might differentially work differently for those two kids. So we just started doing some early work to look at whether or not um, we can use function as a, as a moderator variable that would indicate responsiveness to different medications that in some cases have already been ruled out to treat some of these challenges. So with that, I will skip through to my thank you slide and thank all of you. But I also want to thank the team of folks that I work with who've done a lot of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Call. Thank you. Um, before we get started with the roundtable discussions, please remember to take the Poll Everywhere poll, which is going to be on the screen soon. Oh, OK. It's up. It's up. Everybody's welcome to discuss at your tables. Okay, you guys, start your discussions if you haven't already.
Thank you. Uh, just so everybody knows, we have up on the screen what are your questions about challenging behaviors. So please go ahead and submit your questions using Poll Everywhere. And please feel free to upvote or downvote any questions. Everybody, can I please have your attention? Attention, please. The poll everywhere is up, and you're welcome to submit your questions. And you can upvote or downvote if it's of any interest to you. Just wanted to invite the, the speakers in the next this session up to the podium when you get a chance. Thanks. Hot mic. Yep. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Hello, I'm Abby. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Do we know if, if Eva is here? Dr. Call. Okay, we're going to start asking everybody to quiet down. Shh. Thank you. Dr. Ring. 
All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Ring. I'm uh, a member of the uh, Science Advisory Board of the Foundation and uh, a neuroscientist by training. I used to be the CSO at Autism Speaks and before that headed the autism unit at Pfizer and spent a career there in, in industry. We've got a great session. It sounds like a very rich set of conversations have taken place already. We've got a wonderful panel here that is going to help uh, bring some light onto that conversation. And uh, to maximize the time, I'm just going to get out of the way and, and really go one by one. And if each of you can just briefly introdu introduce yourself and uh, start by reflecting on some of the uh, questions we already have appearing on the board, we can get the conversation going. Liz, you want to start off? Okay, I'm Liz Barry Cravis. I'm from Rush. We have a relatively new PMS clinic that's been going on now for about three years, but I have had a clinics for other developmental dis disabilities, and particularly Fragile X, since 1991. So I've um, had a fair amount of experience with behavior, medication treatment, behavioral strategies, um, some of the issues that challenge all patients with developmental disorders like sleep and toileting and, and uh, those kinds of things. Um, so um, I would say that we, one of the, uh, the, in the management of behavior, I think there's a couple of really key points I try to make every time I'm out lecturing. Um, one is that um, a lot of people think that we can use a medication and it may be a quick fix. Uh, and I know we just heard a lot about some great behavioral strategies. We never believe the medications work alone. Sometimes you have to have medications because the patient is dangerous, but you always want to be implementing behavioral strategies, um, sometimes first and sometimes concurrently. Um, so you want really to be using these um, ways of managing behavior together. Um, and then if one is going to use medication, and again, I do a lot of psychopharmacology, so that's what I'm talking about. Um, I have people like Latha at my science center to do um, the behavioral stuff. Um, I think you're, it's really a matter, we have, we have no real controlled trials in developmental disabilities and genetic rare diseases. We, we don't have information on what is the best medication to use. Um, so it's really a very careful clinical assessment of the patient and look at what is the behavior that's most getting in the way of the patient's functioning and is that even, um, is that even a, uh, a, a behavior that's targetable by a medication. And then if it is, um, you know, sometimes there are, there are multiple types of behavior. What can we do about it and what's a good systematic approach to uh, trying to manage the most problematic behavior and then go systematically through other ones if after you manage one thing, um, other things are still a problem. Um, and so I think that's all I'm going to say because I think it's really important to get to the questions. Hi, I'm Audrey Thurm. I'm a clinical psychologist and wannabe BCBA um, and, um, and I'm working with the Fellow McDermott Foundation uh, with the uh, longitudinal study. And whoever asked the question about cause and effect, that was an amazing, awesome question, and so we can address it again. But what I want to say is that I sat at a great table um, who had, we had four people, and I asked how many people got FBAs, and only one out of the four got an FBA so far, and that one happened to be the one who was verbal, the child who's verbal, the people, who, the kids who are nonverbal did not get the FBAs, and I think that is not just a coincidence at all, and I think, there's a lot of assumptions that there is no cause and effect um, you know, knowledge. And linking this back to the communication talk that I gave here two years ago, these things are totally linked. Um, you know, whether you have cause and effect and understanding, whether you can have an FBA, everybody can have an FBA and we can figure out how. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, the functional behavioral analysis. I thought it, it was. Um, it was defined so well, it was defined so well, um, a functional behavior analysis, and that needs to be connected to, um, to communication and speech and, and whatever augmentative communication might be going on, because those things have to be linked together for, for things to work, and I think we'll talk more about that. I have my own. Um, hi, I'm Letha Surya. I'm a psychologist at Rush, um, and came into working with um, families and people with PMS through fellowships in early, um, my early career at Mount Sinai. And I'm also a behavior analyst. And so I was really excited to hear Dr. Call's talk because these, there are strategies, and especially on the dissemination piece, because there are so many really good strategies that behavior analysts and psychologists and educators know. It's a question of feeling um, competent and feeling how, 
whether you could use that with populations you might not see that often. And so figuring out ways, when I was at a table, I am at a table with um, families of six to seven year olds. And right now, they're not managing, not, not one person is um, having to manage right now in their day to day life, the severe aggression, severe behaviors that we see. But there is a concern and a imminent concern that these are behaviors that are gonna be part of their lives soon. And so how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna disseminate these strategies? And um, I think that Dr. Call is doing some interesting research. And I think some of the consultation models that the foundation's working on could help too. Uh, my name is Eva Lord. I am an associate professor at um, King's College in London. Um, we have started a, a study on uh, Philip McDermott syndrome a couple of years ago, which is embedded in a sort of larger European program on autism. And um, one of the things that um, I had a quick look at our, our data before I, before I came here. I'm not a, an expert in aggressive behavior. Um, but what I noted is that across different sort of aggressive or challenging behaviors at the group level, we find very little differences between autism and the children with Philip McDermott syndrome. Um, either they look uh, very similar or the group with Philip McDermott syndrome is sort of in the, in the intermediate between the autism group and the typically developing children. But this really um, belies the incredible individual difference that we find in each of these different groups. So that the average really does not give you a good indicator where your individual child might lie. Where I thought the um, comparison um, with, with autism might be useful, and we've um, spoken a little bit on our table about that, is that in our sample in London, um, <coughs> about 80% of the children with Cerebral Myxoma Syndrome would also um, have a diagnosis of autism, at least in the broader sense. And some of the challenging behaviors might um, be linked to some of the similar reasons that we see in the children with autism. So, for example, when it's to do with anxiety, when it's to do with transitions, when it's to do with unexpected changes, or when it's to do with um, being frustrated of not being able to pursue a particular activity that the child really likes to engage in. And um, so I think perhaps um, also to inform treatment or intervention, it might be useful to think about what might be causing this particular behavior at a particular moment in time. Is it possible to predict when there are times where there are more challenging behaviors, perhaps because um, it's a period where there's relatively less structure in the life of the child than other times um, in order to try to minimize the behavior that could be difficult both for the child and the family. So I think I've been introduced. You, you most have, you uh, definitely have. I don't know if this one's on. Um, yeah, so I think that, that the panel's brought up some, some really great points. Our table had, I think, a pretty robust discussion about some of these topics. Um, you know, the, the question about the FBA or functional behavioral assessment, there's actually, there's a difference between functional assessment, functional analysis. What I presented is a functional analysis, which is that analog kind of setting up different conditions to test behavior. Functional assessment is a more umbrella term that can mean a, a, a much more broad assessment that can include questionnaires and interviews and stuff like that. Um, and, and the literature shows that, that most BCBAs or behavior analysts who are trained know how to do the, the, the functional assessment, which is much more straightforward, but also is not as rigorous and, and so oftentimes is not going to produce the same kinds of, of in, uh, information that can help intervention as a functional analysis. And as I said, only about there's a uh, survey that was done about a year ago that showed that only about 51% of uh, BCBAs are trained to do the more rigorous form of functional analysis. And it sounds like even then, a lot of people aren't even getting the less intensive version. So that's a concern. And I think that they're just, we talked at our table about the kinds of centers like Marcus, where I work, where we're set up to see the toughest of the tough and to do very um, systematic assessments and treatments to see, to address really, truly challenging behaviors. Um, but there just aren't enough centers like that, which is why some of the dissemination that we were talking about is really key, mm. whether that be through using telehealth to see families who live in outlying areas where there's no one who has the kind of expertise that's needed to help a child, or, or if that means doing things like these types of clinical trials where the outcome is to produce a manual that you could hand off to somebody who has some baseline set of skills 
maybe not the full uh, training to do the, the most rigorous version of these interventions, but you can hand them a treatment manual like the one we developed for elopement. The whole point of that was to be able to give that to a, a reasonably well-trained person who can then go out and work with families, and so they don't have to come to a center like ours in order to get the care that they need. It's a wonderful start, and you know, I just want to maximize the time we have with everyone in the audience to feel free and to ask questions of the panel. It's a great opportunity to get uh, get some feedback on, or we can go into these questions, or if people want to raise their hands if they've got uh, specific questions up here in the front. Uh, I'm wondering from the panel, where it seems like that with the older children, once they're an adult, once they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, that's where Is that not working? Though what happens is as the patients get older, once you get past 18, it's less than 5% of patients that are getting any kind of behavioral services. So this is a huge issue with adults. You know, I see adults all the time in my clinic that, you know, have been seeing psychiatry somewhere and they're, they've at, they're on seven medications and the approach every time they have, the be, have a behavior is just to raise medication. And nobody's even asked why any of these patients are having the behavior. So it's, it's an enormous deficit. I think it's a societal challenge. And I think it's, the onus is really on the clinics that exist for a certain disorder. Like in Fragile X, we now have a rule that every Fragile X clinic in the consortium has to have a way of seeing adults and a way of providing adult services and you have to come up with what your plan is. And I think that's something that, um, that could be done. I, I think now that we have, the PMSF has funded a, um, an adult project, and I think that's the first step, is to figure out what the problems are and then try to implement um, solutions in clinic. But finding services in the adult world is um, just, you know, that's, that's something that we need to lobby the government for or something, because really um, it's, it's, it's a big deficit. That's, yeah, that's the problem. Right, absolutely. Hey, excuse me? Um, we, we really want to try to keep on track here, so if we can hold the questions from the audience until later, if there's any time, we can get back to it, but we really need to stay on track here with the, the questions that are up here. Thanks. So we've seen uh, toilet issues pop up in two different places here. Uh, yeah. Like Talk so, about the resources and... Um, I'll talk just for a, a quick minute because I've been talking and give the microphone to the behavioralist, but um, w toileting is a huge problem for every genetic developmental disability. You know, the toileting session at the Fragile X meeting is always out the door and people can't even get in. Um, and we've only got about, we know now from our natural history study, we've only got about 20% of the patients who well, 20% of the patients who don't toilet train um, before they're 18, and uh, the majority do toilet train. Having autism is a big factor in terms of whether a Fragile X patient toilet trains, and that's probably true across multiple disorders. But when we analyzed all of our data from a big natural history project, the one thing that correlates most with toilet training is the person's communication ability. So I think that's huge in terms of whether a person is going to toilet. And now we even have a multivariate analysis that suggests that we should even, if we, if we see a kid that's going down a road of, of having relatively um, poor communication skills, um, that child also may not have very good control. It may not just be the communication. It may just be that that's a sign of a patient that isn't, you know, really able to control things very well. And we need to pull that child out and say, okay, we may not get to a situation where this child is going to independently be able to toilet. We need to start working on 
time training and kind of struct pl just plan for structured toileting throughout the, the patient's life. And so that we, 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 we have to recognize there may be some physical aspects to the disability, especially in a severely hypotonic um, patient that you know, may, may be involved in why the patient isn't toilet training. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that that literature is all accurate in terms of just kids who are likely to get toilet trained through typical processes or at home or even, you know, with, with help from home. At the same time, we've, uh, we, our clinic, we have a clinic that just does toilet training. Um, it's a, it's a two-week admission, and, and the toilet training literature on how one goes about teaching kids uh, who are quite low-functioning in many cases um, is pretty well established, at least as it comes to treating continent urinations. Um, it goes back 30 or so years. It's not super complex. A lot of time it's about getting lucky that first time. It's constant sits on the toilet, and, and eventually you have to identify when you sit them enough, eventually they go. We do things called fluid loading where you give them lots of stuff to drink so that you increase your chances. But there are some things that make that more or less challenging. One is that's really hard to do at home. And we're talking somebody is sitting with that kid six hours in a bathroom for two weeks, right? And that's not something that most parents can do on their own. Um, the other thing is you've got to, we were talking at our table, that one of the real limitations is you've got to have something that, that kid cares about. Because when they go the first time, you've got to just heap on reinforcement, right? You've got to give that child the thing that's most important to them. And some kids, there's just not a whole lot in the world that they care that much about, which is going to make that challenging. Having said that, our, our outcomes for that clinic are quite good, including for kids who um, have had pretty robust attempts prior to that. Um, our newest research is more focused on encopresis, which is focusing on kids who are not having continent bowel movements. Um, we only work with kids who don't have continent bowel movements who are already continent for urinations. Um, and we use a multidisciplinary approach where we work closely with the GI, and I think that's really important for the reasons that were highlighted earlier. You need, you need to make sure this is a kid who has the the physiological wherewithal to do this um, and make sure that there aren't other physiological reasons or anatomical reasons that would prevent a child from being successful. But again, with that approach, and we were in the midst of a larger clinical trial now because our, our initial clinical trial had quite good outcomes. And we averaged about a 1,400% improvement um, in a, in a uh, weightless control. So uh, this is just something that there's not a whole lot of, of research on at this point, and so we're trying to, to continue to do this work and um, see if we can't get this into the hands of people who can do this because it's not the most complicated protocol so long as people can invest the time and the energy and um, so I think that's that's where the limitation is largely. I don't know if uh, anyone would like to take a crack at the third question there dealing with aggressive outbursts and unprovoked sort of aggression. Um, it's an interesting one to hear quite a bit about. Anyone would like to address that? So this, sorry I don't mean to to dominate the, yeah, so, so this exact issue came up at our table, so I'm fresh, right? I'm, we just talked about this. Um, the, we, I hear this a lot, you know, that you say, well, we need to understand the purpose the behavior serves or the function of the behavior for our child, but there is no purpose. It's just random, and, and, and I hear that quite often. And I think that that's a very understandable perspective because most of the time when you're living your life and you've got somebody who's aggressive who, um, when you're dealing with it, it does seem random because there's so much variability in the, the environment. There's so many factors that are at play that it's really hard to isolate any particular factor and how it might contribute to that kid's or that individual's aggressive behavior. I, I gave the example. When I go to the store with my son and he has a tantrum, man, it's really hard to figure out, like, why today? Because we come to this store, like, four times a week and... But today, for some reason, you're having a tantrum, and it could be for any number of things or any number of combination of factors, like it's too loud or too crowded or he's hungry or he's tired or the clerk said something to him that he didn't like or he sees another kid with a balloon. There's just so many things going on that it's really hard to isolate what things were causing that particular episode of behavior. And that's why the types of assessments I talked about earlier, especially for those, sometimes you can just tell. Like you spend five minutes with someone and this kid's doing that to get attention. And this kid's doing that to get his iPad, right? That's a really clear instance. But there are those episodes that are those individuals where it's much more complex. And that requires the type of functional analysis that I was talking about earlier, distinct from functional assessment, where we, in our clinic, we have special setups where we have a room that it's, we can put anything in the room or remove anything in the room so that we're controlling everything that goes in there so we know what are the variables and we can test them one at a time. We're staffed in a way that we can have staff who can work with very aggressive patients. We're staffed three to one, so three staff per kid, not the other way around. They can wear protective equipment head to toe if they need to um, because sometimes that's what it takes for these really complex behaviors that don't seem to have a really clear-cut pattern, but I will say that it is very unusual for us after we spend the time that we don't find something, that there typically is a pattern there somewhere. It does take a lot of digging, though.
Hello. I think sometimes that random behavior is really an attempt at communication, and probably that's what you would find when you do your analysis. But the child doesn't have any good way to really engage other people, so they kind of whap them because that gets attention. And then, of course, it's reinforced because somebody turns around and you know, talks to them or gives them the input that they're, they're looking for. So I think there probably are good um, behavioral strategies to approach that. And if I would just add, communication about maybe how they're feeling or what might lower their threshold for being aggressive also. So that there's, if the, they're, they have trouble communicating, they can't communicate when they're tired, when they're sick, when they're hungry. What are all those things that influence whether behavior happens or not? Okay, we've got uh, time to take on another one of our, our, our questions up here. And uh, clearly this comes up quite a bit, but uh, the, the question about best therapies for children with pica you know, seems to be a recurrent you know, theme here. Uh, anyone like to take that one on? <laughs> yeah, um, so pica is, is tricky. I, I mentioned that, you know, again, there's, there was a whole literature talking about function and functional assessment of pica, and then we looked through all of our data and couldn't find one instance where pica was communicative in the way that aggression frequently is, right? That for the vast majority of the individuals we treated who engaged in pica, it just seemed to be that that's how they interacted with the world. They kind of put things in their mouth. They mouth things. Sometimes they swallow those things. It's very dangerous. And so in those situations, we aren't going to be able to, to um, teach communication as a replacement behavior. Instead, what we have done is um, teach individuals to uh, exchange those items. So instead of putting in it, if we, we had a kid, the kid who I showed with the safety pin, right, who he swallowed the safety pin and had to have it removed. Now, when he walks into a room, he scans the room, and he finds the kinds of things that he used to put into his mouth, and he's learned that if I bring that to mom, mom will give me a fruit snack, and he loves fruit snacks, right? So he'll exchange those for fruit snacks, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so he's all about finding as many of those things as he can. We've also taught him that if mom's not around, find a garbage can, and he's got a special garbage can that he can put those items in, and then when mom sees that, she knows that there's three things in there, he gets three fruit snacks, and that's been very effective for him. Um, but it's those types of strategies ha can be successful. It's tough to treat, though, again, because if that's just how the kid explores the world, they find whatever sensory uh, stimulation uh, that pleasurable of putting things in their mouth, you're, all, you're essentially trying to combat that by overriding it with something more valuable. First of all, you've got to have something more valuable, and you've got to be able to teach those types of skills and discrimination skills. And so that can be tough, um, but it can be effective. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we've run out of time for this session. I just want to take the uh, opportunity to thank our panelists for the excellent commentary. Thank everybody for participating in this session. I'm sure these folks would be happy to answer questions on the, the sideline for anyone who might have them or didn't feel like we covered enough here. Uh, are we breaking for? We're, yeah, thank we you. Go. Thank you so much to everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we are going to have a 30-minute break. We have coffee and cookies and snacks back here. So if we could just make sure to have everybody back here at 4 o'clock, please.
Are you you're on the next panel? Yeah. And then I can track you afterwards. I just had a few questions to of course during our whole as soon as I got home I'm like, why didn't I ask her about that, you know? Uh, but no, I uh, appreciate it. I was glad to hear that you were coming here. So, because the one thing that I'm, we do really, the biggest concern is, for Nicole, truly, is body temperature. She cannot tolerate heat at all. And and I was like, as I was reading the report that you had sent to her PCP, I was like, Are you oh, waiting for him as well? Never got in there Are you waiting we didn't for really him? talk about yeah, it. Yeah, me too. No, and, and, right. But it, we didn't come up, and I, I think what had happened was, you know, from my point of view, is you know, so they much do, of they do, they do. But my child and is older, and we don't have. There's not me, an ABA so therapist, and I'm like, that will dead. see him so, in our that's county, the thing, and, the and we're not, well, we cannot go outside of our county. We have, yeah, right now they're just saying, well, it doesn't Mom work. Missouri, nobody will see him. I've called all the counties. Nobody will see him. Right. Okay. Hi. How do I get my child into your program, right. your at the Marcus Center? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or are you guys thinking about doing a research with PMS children? So this is my first exposure right. to this one. Right. Right. Sit down. Yeah, you've seen kids with PMS. But, okay. but not specific, it's not like we're going out on our way, we just see who walks for it. Right? Okay. So, uh, all kinds of different disorders. Right. right. Um, I, um, our center's quite good. I think we're, we're pretty okay. good at what we need. Um, but I also am always really hesitant to tell a family, oh, you need to come. Like, I'm not trying to right. build the cycles, right? Like, exactly. I'm not trying to set up, like, a church. Right. I want to have, like, service that helps families and I don't and I, I want families right. to get what they need and they shouldn't have to come to Atlanta to get what they need. Right. You know? Right. So so if right. there's a way like, for people to get what they need without doing that. And then, I mean just I mean be, just from walking here to the car she always has to just like to answer that question. You know what I'm okay. Yeah. Right. I just don't want and so I don't want, and I don't, I don't have the secret sauce. Right. Exactly. Right. No, no, no. I mean, we, what we've done is, I mean, we well, they want us to put him in a psychiatric hospital. In We're in well, Missouri. So he went to a psychiatric so hospital. We have you do. Yeah. So now yes. It's, it's not a preference. It's a health issue. Okay. So that's why I'm like, I need to have that. And we would. I know because I didn't. I know it's my. It's my body. Not to the same degree as right, right. right. You may not be able to handle the same level of intensity. Um, what is her name? Helen Schitt's S C H I E L Z or T. Such okay. and whatever. And, and you know, then like things like uh, she can't be out on hot days for long. Know you know, about, like, just that kind of thing that it needs. But that's fine. And I'll, you know what? Okay. I can follow up and just send you an email and. Done some of the same kind of stuff that Madison I Madison can give it to you. Okay, okay so you'd rather me email Madison and then she can. Like if you can get what you need closer to home, that's going to be better for you, better for your child. She can. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Okay. I understand. When we see kids from Atlanta where we are, a big part of what we're trying to do, we go to their house. Before right. they even come in, we go to their house and spend a day at home with them, and we spend our mid to our whole admission. And then we start going home with them. We spend two right. weeks in the house. So we did side, start the whole thing. We're going to close the things right uh, like that. So yeah. But when I'm from Missouri, exactly, Missouri. Right. exactly. Right. right, right. And so we're very rural, so Columbia is two and a half hours away. Okay. I know. Her nurse, I saw that there's going to be that, um, those guys that are woo Exactly. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, see, I went upstairs, and I left. I brought him lunch. I left the room. He took one bite of his sandwich. The sandwich went everywhere. He got up. He cleared the table. He went over to the sink. He cleared that one. He went to the bathroom. He cleared. And you can't with your one person. You can't. And I left her up there. I said, "Give me my out of there." You, you've got to control that situation. So that she did right now, and to do that. What is, what is your thought about this? Oh. Uh, yeah. 
pasta. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not answering your question maybe the way. Right. You want. I mean, the truth is, yeah. If you reach out, you call the Martin's Auction Center and say, "I want to come." They'll get you in line. You know, it's a, it's a waiting. It list. is. It's an eight-month waiting yeah. list. Yeah. Right. We're always hesitant to bring a camera. Okay. This is the burden. We don't want to be. Right. You can help you get what you need. Closer to home, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, he's 24. He's extremely strong. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I wonder if the Thompson Center takes a 24-year-old. They might. But I don't know. They might. Yeah, and I think that if they don't, they should right. know. Okay. Like, you know, so I only is quite good. Okay. That's where I train. Right. Oh no. 